Good morning. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to rattle through um, a shorter time period, but to some extent, um, there's a greater quantity and variety of evidence, perhaps. Um, no, that's not entirely true, but a shorter time period, but a lot to say. Um, Cash has already mentioned uh, the Fenland Research Committee, and it's really with the Fenland Research Committee that the detailed study of the Roman landscape of the Ewes washes and the wider Roman Fenland begins. Um, pioneering research carried out by the likes of Peter Solway, Sylvia Hallam, John Bromwich, that was all pulled together and published in 1970 in the Fenland in Roman times. And this provides a good baseline, a good starting point for understanding the subject. This was followed then by the Fenland project um, between 1981 and 1988, carrying out extensive field surveys. And on the back of that, the Fenland management project carrying out targeted excavations between 1991 and 1995. I mention this to preface what follows, but also by way of acknowledgement, because much of what I'm going to talk about today is very much rooted in this research. So in very broad terms, this is the third time we'll see a part of this slide, um, we can identify three different landscape environments in the Roman Fenland. We have uh, areas of upland here shown in white, as Cash has already said, forming the southwest area, and up here where we are today in the northwest, and a string of islands on either side of the Ewes washes. Sorry, go back one. Um, we have the central area of the Ewes washes shown in brown, an area of peat fen, a freshwater depositional environment. And then in the very northern area, we have the area that was under marine influence for at least part of the Roman period. And that extends into two sort of little fingers cutting through um, the area as we can see. So if we look at the archaeological evidence that's been recorded so far on this topographic map, I hope you can see uh, those purple dots. And this is the information recorded, the Roman sites and find spots recorded in the Cambridgeshire and Norfolk Historic Environment records. And what we can see straight away by looking at this is that the, uh, the data is not evenly distributed throughout the Ewes Washes area and its immediate surroundings. I, I was hoping that I wasn't going to be the first person to show HER data in this way, um, but I should obviously point out that uh, this is a data set that closely hugs the Ewes Washes project area. The fact that there's nothing up there and nothing down there is just that that data is not shown. It's not, not blank. Um, but what we can see uh, from that is that, as I say, there's a large sort of lack of data in the middle area, but what we have got recorded very much hugs the edge of the upland and lives along the fen edge. And it's the upland area that I want to look at first. Um, I'm not going to talk about specific sites. I'm going to keep it kind of a landscape level, at least for the first part of the talk. Uh, but just to give you a quick sort of series of highlights, um, Chris has just talked about the Colne Fen sites, the amazing sites there, the campground site, the inland port on the uh, Cambridgeshire Kydike Canal, just literally down the road from that, uh, the Langdale Hale Farm site, which is uh, developed in the Roman period. We have other um, sites, such as Langwood Farm at Chatteris, a farmstead site there on the edge of one of the islands along the edge of the Ewes Washes. That one, significant because it's got a substantial stone building that was constructed in the second to third centuries, which can be compared with Stony, just slightly outside of the area. And, as has already been mentioned, a dot somewhere off the bottom of the screen there, um, the Fendrayton Villa site from the third to fourth centuries. So we have a combination there of nucleated settlements like campground and sort of more Romanised farmsteads, villas, but the majority of what perhaps exists in the, uh, around the Fen Edge there are much more simple uh, farmstead sites based around trackways and enclosures. And if we look at the area around Over, which was one of the areas looked at in detail by the Fenland project, um, sorry, we get uh, sites such as this one just to the, to the north uh, northeast of Over there, which I hope you can just about make out the crop marks. Um, there's a trackway running through there. Another one coming down here. There's another parallel trackway up here and a series of small enclosures. This one's showing very well on Google Earth and there's uh, lots of potential to, uh, to examine some of these sites from the, the warmth and comfort of your own home from the crop mark evidence. The upland areas were probably being exploited in a, in a variety of different ways, as Chris has already said. Um, certainly, those landscapes are being used for arable agriculture. The actual Arable production isn't something that we get a huge amount of evidence for, but the processing is something that usually shows up more archaeologically. And 
This is just some of the sites and the type of cereal crops that they've produced. Perhaps the fen edge itself is more being used for a pastoral economy, wetter grazing land on the fen edges as well as in some of the upland areas. And the animal bone assemblages point to this being dominated by cattle, which is common really for many Roman sites throughout the Roman period. Sheep and pigs in lesser quantities. So to look on then to the peat fen, the central area of the ooze washes, which looks something like that. This is actually Wiccan fen, I apologise, it's slightly outside the area. Um, whilst it's fairly certain that this is a freshwater depo depositional environment in the Roman period, that it's, it's fen like this, one of the problems, one of the challenges facing us as archaeologists is that we don't have the peat that was being deposited in the Roman period surviving. Almost all of it has gone through later pink peat shrinkage and wastage as a result of the drainage from the 17th century period uh, onward. And with the loss of that peat went the pollen evidence that would give us the opportunity to provide an accurate reconstruction of that vegetational environment in the Roman period. But nevertheless, I think we can be fairly confident that we're looking at an environment something like this. Areas of open water such as Willingham Mere in places and rivers cutting through it. We've already heard something about the resources of the Fenland, so I'll skate through them very, very quickly again. Yes, the wildfowl, important, but as Chris has just said, there seems to be some variety to the extent that these are being exploited at different sites at different points. The pelicans are there again um, from the Colm Fen site. I think that demonstrated, I think I'm right, that that demonstrated that there were still summer migrants yeah. into the Roman period, uh, which hadn't previously been, uh, been known to be the case. We also have, of course, the fish from the rivers, again, not necessarily being exploited at all sites at all times. We should also think about the, the animals, um, as Chris has just mentioned, the beaver and the otter and things like that, which are being exploited for their furs. The reeds themselves, the willow, the rushes, um, perhaps carl woodland around the edges being exploited. Lots of uses for that sort of thing, thatching, flooring, basketry, wickerwork, the sort of stuff that doesn't usually survive very well uh, archaeologically, the organic stuff that goes. Unfortunately, we don't have a Roman equivalent of must farm to find this stuff. Um, in incredible quantities, but uh, we know that that certainly was taking place. And peat cutting, um, the peat itself being extracted for fuel. We don't necessarily have much evidence in the southern part of the ewes washes for peat extraction, but it's a different case in the north, as we shall see. The peat fen was not an entirely stable environment throughout the Roman period, and there's some evidence to suggest that peat growth um, resulted in gradual encroachment onto the fen edge and sort of periodic flooding of some of those settlements. So this would have, of course, presented challenges to those living there. But for the second part of this talk, I want to focus on the northern area, partly because it's where we are today and partly because it provides good evidence of landscape change. As we've already heard, sea levels rose in the period previously and they started to recede again uh, in the early part of the Roman period. The area to the north of the Ouse Washes had very much been an environment, a coastal environment of salt marsh, mud flats at various points preceding the Roman period. And certainly at the start of this period, we've got tidal creeks extending down into the Peat Fen. And what we can see is that there are two of these that are relevant to the area. One following the line of the Old Cross River comes down through Wellney and Littleport, and another extending across through Upwell and Nordelf across to Denver. Um, What's also apparent, I think, hope you can make out, is that those two tidal creeks represent concentrations of Roman uh, archaeology that's been recorded. These creeks um, formed roddens. Kasha briefly mentioned roddens. Um, I'm sure most people are familiar with them as a, as a landscape feature, but essentially what happens is you get a tidal creek um, that's bringing silt in with it, um, these overtop their banks, they flood, they deposit the silt on either side, forming levees, and ultimately the channel itself silts up, and this creates a, a bank following the line of the former channel, which is higher and drier than um, the surrounding peat fen, which can then be occupied. Focusing on that northern um, channel, extending across sort of Denver, Upwell, uh, Nordelf area, this becomes the line of a major communication route during the Roman period, the Fen Causeway. The Fen Causeway exists at various times as a road, as a canal, sometimes as both. It extends from the Fen Edge at Denver all the way across, island hopping through March and Whittlesea, across 
to the Roman town at Durabrive at Water Newton, where it links up with Ermine Street. It's thus often seen as a major route connecting the Midlands with northern East Anglia in the Roman period. Excavations, probably, basically the, the very dark line is the line of the canal, and we'll come back to that in a moment. Excavations at Downham West demonstrated that the earliest phase at that location was actually the road, which we've got in here. Dating evidence from the excavations at, De at Denver across this road demonstrated that it was constructed in the 1st century AD during the Neronian period, so the third quarter of the 1st century AD. And this compares well with excavations further west in Cambridgeshire. Somewhat inevitably, with a construction date around about in the third, century, uh, the third quarter of the 1st century AD, a post boudican revolt uh, interpretation has sometimes been put forward for the construction of the Fen Causeway, that it was constructed to allow swift movement of troops from the Midlands through to East Anglia. That may be the case, but we don't really have any evidence to uh, support that in detail. The second phase at Downham West was the construction of a canal, which we see on this side, and actually the southern bank of the canal overlapped the first phase of the road. Subsequent road surfaces were built up, and it's likely at this point in time that the canal and the road exist parallel to one another at the same time, but we can't be absolutely certain. Dating evidence for the canal isn't entirely clear, but probably around the 2nd century AD. One of the important things about this section, however, both the one at Downham West and at Denver, is that the the first road itself was constructed on a layer of bricotage. That's the fragments of the clay vessels, uh, troughs and supports being used in the salt making process. Salt making is probably the most important, or one of the most important industries in the Iron Age and Roman periods around the Wash coastline. In all the areas that are under marine influence, we're seeing evidence of salt making activity. And certainly whatever the reason for the Fen Causeway Road and Canal being constructed, it would have been useful for exporting that salt. One of the things that it does tell us, uh, the fact that the early road is built on the, the salt-making evidence, is that although the levees of the Rodden were dry enough to be occupied at that time, clearly the channel to which it related had still got salt water in it to a sufficient level that it could still be being used for, for uh, salt extraction. And of course, once the canal is constructed, that too is bringing saline water in to keep that salt and industry going. What we also have in the, uh, along the Fen Causeway Rodden is evidence of peat extraction, peat extraction on a massive scale. Crop mark and soil mark evidence has recorded strips of, so uh, of peat extraction running north and south from the Rodden and further west, leading off of the creeks and Roddens of some of the paleo channels uh, to the south of the road. This, as I say, is, is peat extraction on a massive scale and it's very likely that it's, it's providing fuel for the salt industry. Part of the reason that these show up so well as crop marks and soil marks is because the turberries, the peat cuttings, get infilled with marine flood silt. This is a yellowish colour and it contrasts beautifully with the dark black of the peat through which it's been cut. So we can see clearly the dark lines of the bulks between the peat cuttings and the yellow of the infilled uh, peat cuttings themselves. This silt appears to have been deposited around about the mid-3rd century AD in a flooding event or series of flooding events at that time. It would have filled in the canal uh, as well if the canal had already silted up of its own accord at that point in time. And of course, silting up the canal means the end of the Sultan industry. So this is quite an important event for the, for the landscape and land use in the northern part of the, of the Ouse Washes. It probably has a knock-on effect in the southern part as well because this flooding event in the north causes a backing up of water that's trying to drain out, and there appears to be some sites in the southern Ouse Washes where there's freshwater flooding as a result of the, of the drainage being impeded. The mid-third century flooding represents very much a hiatus on the, on the Rodden, separating the early Roman and late Roman activity. But it didn't take long for it to become reoccupied. By the late third century, a new road has been constructed along the southern side of the Rodden, 
and the work of the Fenland project identified farmstead sites located on the Rodden. The most important of these within the project area is this site at Straw Hall Farm at Downham West. At this site, north is to the, the left here as you're looking at it. The sinuous crop mark that I hope you can make, up, make out up here is a combination of the early road, the canal and the late road all together at that point. Um, and we've got this series of rectilinear enclosures extending off to the north of the road associated with late 3rd and 4th century settlement activity, a series of paddocks. Some of these enclosure ditches actually utilise creeks that are cut, cutting through and draining that th mid-3rd century silt. So you can see there's this creek running through here, which has been partly utilised by this uh, man-made ditch. We don't know a huge amount about the economy of, of these farmsteads. Um, we didn't really get, I don't think, a lot of paleoenvironmental evidence out of the... Uh, the excavations that were, were carried out there, but it's likely that the silt deposits, at least in the initial part of the occupation, the reoccupation of the Rodden, would have been too saline to really support cereal production, and we might well be looking at a pastoral economy, uh, rough grazing again, perhaps something, this is Halvergate Marshes in, in East Norfolk, but this kind of rough grass, water-filled dikes um, and cattle. Another particular feature which perhaps fits in very well with this pastoral economy idea are crop mark sites which are perhaps peculiar to the, the fens, a small ring ditch crop marks, narrow ring ditches, about 10 metres in diameter, which cluster along some of the roddens. Um, I hope you can just about make some of these out. They are generally interpreted as drip gullies around stack stands, possibly for um, hay, for fodder, for animals, or they could be stacks of um, cut reeds and rushes, perhaps. The end date for activity along the Rodden isn't really clearly identified. Excavations further west at, at London Lode Farm identified that the later road surface was buried beneath um, post-Roman, early post-Roman flood silts. So it's going out of use at some point around that time um, as marine uh, encroachment takes over and more flood silts are deposited. So to conclude, challenges and opportunities. The Roman landscape of used washes was one that presented its inhabitants with a very complex mixture and changing mixture of challenges and opportunities. Water was, as we've heard in the previous talks, an ever-present feature of this landscape, and it's central to its rich resources and communications, being ultimately responsible for the important salt-making industry, the peat extraction, the vegetation resources, and the food resources that make this landscape work. <coughs> but inevitably, that means that very much Changes in the water level frequently presented challenges to those communities living along the Fen Edge. The rising water levels resulted in flooding of settlements and routeways, both in the freshwater and marine environments at various points in time, making sites unviable and closing down the salt making industry in various locations. But that flooding also presented opportunities at times. Whereas the Rodden became unusable in, in the mid third century, it wasn't long before there was an opportunity to recolonize it. There may have been different generations of people who did that, so one, the people affected by the flooding might not have actually lived long enough to see the opportunity of recolonising it. Those challenges and opportunities, of course, continue to resonate today in the used washes landscape, not least from an archaeological perspective. The Roman period archaeology, like those that precede it, is fantastic, and sites incredibly complicated, and sites like the Colne Fen sites that Chris mentioned demonstrate what wealth of information there is out there. Um, what a fantastic opportunity there is. <coughs> it's challenging to interpret, but it is a, a fantastic opportunity. And I think those sites will continue to allow us to develop our understanding of that landscape um, for some time to come. Thank you. <laughs>